Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar entitled The Psychology of Spending, being brought to you by Balance. My name is Jasper, and I serve as the Community Development Manager, new title now. And actually, on the line, I also have with me my 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 great, great friend, uh, Joe. Joe, are you here with us today? Yes, I am. Hello, everybody. Super excited to have you. All right. Thank you so much for that introduction, Joy. Soy will be helping me to manage the, the question box because, again, this is one of our, um, our part of our free webinar series, and we get a lot of people who, who, who come in. <laughs> so we never know how the activity will be throughout the session. And so what Joy will be doing is keeping an eye on the question box. And so she may be able to respond to things right here, um, uh, live while we're doing the session, but also, too, there may be some questions that pop up that uh, she may interrupt me at any point, and we might just have a nice little discussion right then and there. And so speaking of which, you don't have to wait. I know some people on these webinars like to wait until they to ask the question, but you don't have to. So Joey's here to help me ask them, and, and again, if we need to all this throughout the session, we will do so. The question is right then and there, and we should have enough time. You know, we we allot an hour for these sessions, but we should have plenty of time at the end to to field any final questions and have some discussion. So, I uh, just wanted to share that with you, and also too, um, I love. There's like a little icon that you will see on your on your toolbar, and I love the hand icon. Like it's just the one piece that that gives me this. Thing, we're in a room together, so I can't see your hands and your arms being raised, but a lot of times you may hear me say hand button or let me see a show of hands. And so I try to make sure these sessions are as engaging as possible because I know we've kind of been sheltering in place over the last few months and, you know, we've been on a lot of webinars. So um, I do my best to try to stay as engaged as possible as we go to it. And a few more housekeeping things that, right before we hop in is. Uh, right after the conclusion of this, or whenever you log out, you will get a feedback survey. We recommend you all, you know, being as honest as you'd like about how the experience went. But you also get access to the recording of this session for some days. So a lot of people may chime in and chime out. We know things pop up, and you might have to hop off a little bit early. But don't worry, the record everything will be able for seven days. So if you do miss something, just, you know, once you get the link for the recording, just come back in and take your time. You can hit pause and catch up on anything that you missed during the session. All right. And also, so we've had some some issues around audio uh, concerns and, you know, it's, I don't know if it's from our end, but we've kind of tested out all of our our systems, but in case you're having all issues, giving you a few recommendations on, on where you can find this information, uh, because again, sometimes people will say uh, we sound a little garbled, we sound like there's some static, but just let us know if you're having any major concerns with the audio. Uh, just let us know, and, and if it's sometimes it's an isolated incident, if we see too many people responding, then we know something from our end. So I just want to bring that to your attention. And then we just talked about the question box. So this just give you a nice example here around uh, the question box. I'm sure this isn't most people's first time, or if it is, you know, <laughs> there's some good information as it relates to the question box. And, and so again, make sure that, you know, anytime you feel free to put a question into the question box. All right, so we're going to be talking about these emotions <laughs> that lead to our, our buying decisions, and hopefully we can address a few of these areas that will uh, just give you some things to think about. You know, we're all we're all, uh, we're all a work in progress, but it's really taking a deeper dive into our emotional state and seeing how that affects our our spending decisions or buying decisions. A lot more goes into our money choice and cold, you know, rational calculations and our emotions have a huge impact on the bottom line. And by examining the field behind the decisions, you know, you can begin the process of making the most productive choices possible.
All right. So when we're thinking about our spending choices, do you ever wonder why you're buying what you're buying? Psychologists have found that there are some forces govern our consumer behavior and cause us to make decisions that are not necessarily rational or in our best interest. And many people spend to the point that they get into debt or are unable to save. And so again, it's all about understanding why we buy what we buy and are there some things that we can do to make wise decisions in the future. All right, so I didn't tell you that I'm going to tell you right now. We're going to do the work. So <laughs> I hope that you have something to take notes with, or even if you're doing uh, something on your, your iPads or your, your tablets or your phones. But let's take a moment here, and I just want to read you through these questions. Self-evaluate is where we have this whole journey when we're thinking about the psychology of our spending. And I want everybody to be very honest with themselves. This doesn't take long. I want to do is kind of reach question and just give you about 20 seconds to write down, you know, your response. And, and so what we'll do is we'll go through each one of these, give you about 20 seconds to respond. Shouldn't take that long. You, you should know yourself by now, I'm hoping. <laughs> uh, but let's take 20 seconds and we'll go through each one of these questions. Um, and it, it, if at some point, you know, you don't feel like doing it right now because you're recording, this could be a great opportunity for you to come back in to review and then you can take as much time as you need. But since we have them today, I like doing this kind of live just to kind of get you, you know, in tune about the discussion we're about to have. So the first question asks, what products and services do you enjoy spending money on? So, again, the first question you want to ask yourself is what types of products and services do you enjoy spending money on? All right. We've got some coming in. We've got self-care. <laughs> therapeutic activities, and social groups or events. I like it. Nice. Lots of family activities, clothing, groceries, investments. Oh, that's good. It looks like a lot of it nice. is food and clothes, electronics. Oh, we have a sports mm -hmm. memorabilia and sporting events. <laughs> and that's an somebody interesting one. Oh, someone's after my own heart. Chelsea spends her money on coffee and wine and purses <laughs> and home decor. Oh, I love it. Good. Good. Candy. Good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so it's funny, Joy, is uh, I'm seeing vacations. You know, a lot of people yeah. have kind of been on the fence. So I know that's a big one. <laughs> mm -hmm. That it's, we, We've been waiting to get out. Uh, at, same thing with sports. You know, the same thing. About some sport, you're kind of coming back slowly, but there's still a lot of known, but good. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I've got one that's uh, really like organic groceries, and we've got another one that is thrift shopping and family experiences, which I love. I love all of that. <laughs> nice. nice. All right. And I'm sure that stuff will keep coming in as we go through the self evaluation. Again, this is stuff you can, you know, I definitely want people to just consider writing them down uh, as we go along. Also, just because, again, this is going to you as you move forward, just understanding kind of what you're doing and where you're spending. So the second question here is, why do you think you enjoy spending money on said items that some of you had just listed? But as you're writing it down, like, why do you think you enjoy spending money on these particular uh, items, if you will? Oh, here's the good one. Instant gratification. Amy, that is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And then we have because it makes the people important to me happy. Aw. And we have it feels good, that it's a craving, and spending money on self care because you look good and you feel good. And one of them is I like to see my kids happy. I like spending time with my family, mm -hmm. enjoying food. Um, Oh, here's a good one. As a sports fan, it makes them feel connected. Um, mm, lots nice. and lots of good feedback. Oh my gosh, you guys yeah. are amazing. I know, Joyce, I saw one that popped in pretty quickly. She said, I think it was she lost weight and just loves clothes shopping. That's, mm -hmm. I get that one. Like, if people, <laughs> if you have lost some serious weight or just trying to turn over a new leaf and become more healthier, 
it is kind of like a, a treat that, hey, I've worked hard and now I can reward myself. So good, good. We have a nice, lively group today. So I love, I love the interaction. It just makes these things <laughs> go so much, so much better. So the third question, we'll keep on moving here, is in what ways do you think you are a good spender? So you want to ask yourself that question. Um, and what, what way do you think are a good spender? Oh, we have a couple. We have um, hunting to find treasure, loving to find a great deal, coupons, making sure that they buy on sale, spending money locally. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. Jennifer, I'm fired today. Um, researching when making a large purchase. That's really good. Uh, buying only what you can afford and you never pay full price. Um, making sure that you save, comparison shopping, that's really good. Not rushing to make impetuous decisions. Also a really good word, Craig. I love that impetuous. Oh, I'm going to use that more often now. Um, <laughs> let's see, asking friends for recommendations. We just got a lot. I think it's uh, everyone's really focusing on making sure that they're looking for any opportunity to save budgeting, doing it yourself products, or excuse me, projects, and using an allowance. Mm -hmm. Great stuff, you guys. I love nice. it. Absolutely. Yes, yes. So here's a good one. I like them. Uh, next question is, what's in habits like to change? You know, we, we always love the positive things, but we all, we all have, there's that one thing we have, and, and we all know what it is already, and it's, you know, what would we like to change? Um, that's another question. Again, we're, we're doing this, you know, we take a lot of time up front doing the self-evaluation because I, I feel strongly that this is where most people don't spend enough time. I think we, we're just living, right? We're just kind of, you know, day by day moving, moving, but we never take that time to do kind of a simple activity of just asking yourself some basic questions. Because again, these, these questions are very telling. Hey, are there, are there some things we need to change or some things we should continue to do? And are we happy with the results that we have? So again, what spending habits would you like to change? Okay, we've got um, overspending on good deals. So not buying something just because it's on sale. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. Um, knowing when enough is enough and when it's okay not to have the latest and greatest item. Ooh, that's good. I like that one a lot. Um, we have using credit cards too much and tending to overspend on food. Um, but I feel I would be miserable if you just went with the cheaper option all the time. And that's something that's, I get that. <laughs> like sometimes yeah. the great value Cheetos just don't taste as good as the regular Cheetos. <laughs> we have, oh, here's a good one. Um, they are working on setting limits and having more of a reserve so that they can indulge and also be prepared for emergencies without extending the monthly budget for a family of mm. seven. Good gracious, mm. Michelle, God bless you. Mm. <laughs> well, good, good. So the last question you all will see here on the self-evaluation is do you think you can change? So we're talking about the hats would you like to change? And then the last question you want to ask yourself is, how do you think you can change them? Now, here's the real kicker. So, you know, I don't know who is just attending this webinar by themselves or if they have their significant other or their spouse. Here's your first homework assignment is that I want you to do this evaluation with your significant other, your spouse, because again, you understand you <laughs> and they need to understand them. And then there needs to be a conversation around well, what do we both do? What do we both not do? Uh, so that's going to be your, your first homework assignment is to really share this evaluation, you know, with your significant other, or even a friend, because then he, he or she may not be in tune with what they're doing. And again, this is where we start this whole thing about dealing with our, our spending habits, doing this self-evaluation. So, so thank you all for, for the activity in the, in the question box area. I really appreciate the engagement because this is, uh, it just makes a lot more when people are engaged. So thank you all for your responses to the evaluation questions. All right, so let's talk about advertising now. 
we know the purpose of advertising is to get us to buy something. And, and a common tactic that advertisers use is to appeal to a certain fear or desire and claim that their product can provide the image or lifestyle you want. For example, you know, commercials for, for baking, baking products frequently show happy, loving families. And we like to think we are immune to ads, but they can sway us towards certain products, often unconsciously. So what can you do? It's hard to avoid advertisements. Like I, I think it's pretty much impossible unless you literally unplug from the world, like your phone <laughs> and the internet and, and TV. And we, we know that advertisements can provide useful information about products you are already interested in buying. Now the challenge is to recognize the emotional, let say that again, the challenge with most is to recognize the emotional appeals being made in most ads and minimize them so you can rationally judge the true value of what is being sold. And as you encounter advertising in your daily life, think about the validity of the images being presented and what it is that you will actually get from the product or service. Now, we know that data is huge and these companies, I mean, you're everything so quickly and I'm sure all of you can attest to this is you'll be looking at something on your phone and then you'll get on your laptop and then you'll see a banner ad for a site you just left. Like that's how quick this stuff happens. And so you're constantly being bombarded with it. Now, as we think about all these different products that are out here in the marketplace, these advertisers, these groups of people, these marks, they are pretty smart. Like they understand the psychology behind this, which is how we see the images that we see. So here's the example I love is, and I always find it interesting, and you all can, you know, let me know if you're on the page. This is just what I, and I want to talk about like weight commercials, and I don't care what they're, I, my favorite are the various med pills you can take that, that just don't require you to, to, to exercise, but you're going to lose this weight. And I'm saying, you know, let me crazy. Joy, you too, just let me know. So you see the before photo, and the person apparently, you know, is not at the weight they would like you know it's not the prettiest photo the light is a little off like they just look it just looks they're having a bad day and then you see the after photo now they've lost some weight they look a lot better but but to me and it doesn't matter what shade the person is they've always gotten a tan or the lighting is so much better so i'm always like hmm so me losing weight results in me getting a tan or I, i'm gonna like it, do you all under, like? Do you all see that when you see those weight loss commercials when they talk about you know hey before and after photos? Like I find that it's it's been it's been a thing that they have been doing for decades. Um, so I just like to share that idea around advertising because it's I just laugh at thinking like oh my god okay like get, get skin get a tan like I just it doesn't make sense to me but I, I tend to see that year after year that you know the weight loss uh, industry, if you will, or their medicines or whatever they're promoting, it's always the same. Here's the before, they look totally awful, and the second photo is like their lives have changed. And, and we know that's playing on your emotions because as somebody alluded earlier, once you've lost the weight, do get that confidence. And they know that. And that's why they showed the images as such. You know, their claims about does it work, eh, you know, results probably always vary. But it's this notion of just, it's the images we see from these ads, and it's almost like, hmm, how can I appeal to their emotions? Because that's, most of the times, it's emotions that are driving activity. And these advertisers, they know that. They fell to that all day long. So next up, we're going to talk about keeping up with the Joneses. And I did a little research because before this session, I never really knew where it came from. So, you know, shout out to Wikipedia. You know, I found a couple of different uh, sites or, if you will, notations. So there was a comic strip back in 1913. 
and it was the family who was, you know, trying to to move upward in, in initial status. And so they always would reference this family who was never depicted in the comic strip but they were called the Joneses. And so this family in this comic strip was always mentioning or referencing the Joneses. So that was one indication of where this keeping up with the Joneses actually came from. And then there's another, another entry around uh, wealthy families back in the 1850s. And they were families, okay, of course, last name were Jones. And they just kept building these like immaculate villas in the country, like these country villas in New York. And so it became like a thing that every time you built a house, somebody else built a better house. And it just kept going for some time, but these were very wealthy families. And so it became this like petition. And so again, it was again, keeping up with the Joneses. So I had never actually looked that up. So I just wanted to share that little history lesson with you all. Not sure if you all knew the origins of keeping up with the Joneses. And I actually sort of checked to see if there are any Joneses on the session today, but I didn't have a chance to do that. But we know that society defines your success by what we look like and what we own. And it's not surprising that people are tempted to buy things that will make them appear well off, especially when others around them seem to have more. Like that's, that's the catch there, right? We know it looks a certain way, and so we think that means success. You know, maybe always. And while it used to be that they just were the neighbors, now it seems that they've become the people we see everywhere on TV and in movies. You know, there's always a big, you know, mansion, all the clothes, cars, and all of the products they have. And so it just it begins to get embedded in us that we need what they have. So question for the group. Have any of you... Actually, this. Let me this. Um, we're gonna use the hand button on this one because we have some good engagement today. So, show of hands, how many of you have ever felt the pressure to keep up with this? Just a show of hands. How many of you hand button me? But how many of you have ever like fallen victim or felt the pressure of trying to keep up with the Joneses? All right, good, 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 good. Okay. Yeah, that happens. happens. I've been there. It took me a while that funk, but it was it was tough, right? It was always seeing what everybody else has. Okay, so so the follow up question, and so for those who are, are kind of to raise your hand, um, it, it happens to all of us. But what was it that you wanted, or that the Joneses had that you wanted, and did you end up buying it? That's the second part. So again, if anybody has ever felt or succumbed to the pressure of keep up with the Joneses, what was it you were uh, focused on and did you end up buying it? And I just want to see, uh, you can put this in the question box. I just want to see uh, what might have happened. Uh, yeah, so take a moment here. If anybody, again, if you've tried to keep up with the Joneses, did you buy what the Joneses had and or did you not? Okay, so we've got some uh, interesting ones in here. Uh, some of them it seems like they're clothing related, and some of them aren't necessarily finance financial, but still a very good example. Um, somebody wanted to get married because all of their friends were getting married. I think it counts because marriage is um, very expensive, <laughs> and also definitely deals with the emotional aspect of it. That's something you don't want to rush into either. So I still think that counts, Valerie. Um, we have other ones that say champion sweatshirts, decor for my house. Robin, I'm right there with you. I don't need pearl chandeliers, but oh, it looks so good. Um, <laughs> let's see. We've got cars, jewelry, name brands. Oh, timeshares. Oh, my. I like that. Um, bigger house, fancier car. Uh, remodel the house constantly. That's a good one luxury cars, experiences that they wanted to be able to have, like their friends, but that they couldn't really afford, like going out for dinner or to a movie and putting all those expenses on a credit card to keep up with the group. That's really good, Jesse. I love that. That's a great example. Mm -hmm. Try to keep up with your mm -hmm. friends. You know, even going to Taco Bell enough times could really hurt you. <laughs> Trust me, I know. Um, let's see what else. Um, 
to keep up with appearance appearances as to what is normal. And that's really good. That can mean a whole bunch of different things, you know, keeping up with the fads and the, the things that people want to do. I love that. Um, a Peloton bike. Oh, I need that. Mm. There's just so <laughs> much. Good. I love it. I love it. This is good. But, but Joy, what this is, it's, we're human. It ha it happens to all of us. Like that's the thing. And here's here's how we're gonna wrap up this slide here. And it, and we all know this to be true already. You can't win if you try to keep up with the Joneses because there's always gonna be people that more. That's the dilemma. It is we're trying to keep up. It it doesn't serve that well. And I would say it it's it's not like it's not bad to buy luxury goods like that's what i want to get it's not bad it's just we need to be more conscious about what we can afford so so for all those responses you know about trying to keep up it was hey maybe you didn't put yourself in a bind by making that purchase maybe you didn't incur more credit card debt i mean that's the point of when you're trying to keep up it's usually not in alignment with your actual plans and is usually a, to your detriment if you're playing that game. Now, but again, if you can afford these luxury items, by all means, just live your life. <laughs> live your life because we have one life to live. So I don't want people to feel they have to always hold back. But again, just be mindful that if you're trying to keep up and sometimes put yourself uh, or your family in a bind financially and that's the one that we want to make sure we avoid so as we're thinking about our spending habits you know every day we're faced with the hundreds of choices and it's, it's impossible to consciously think about all of them and this is why we tend to adopt spending habits and for example you're, you're faced with the choice of buying your morning coffee at the gourmet coffee house or getting the free but less tasty coffee work now you decide to go with the gourmet coffee and after a while don't even give it a second thought because it's part of your routine and, and the same goes for buying lunch out you know or even sticking with the brands we buy even if comparable items are less here's a good tip that i learned years ago and this was just one of those i was always curious about like the uh over over the counter um medicine so uh, let's say you got a headache and you don't know the popular brands and so one day, and I kind of asked my, my dad, and I said, look, man, is there a real difference? And all he said was, read the labels. I was like, okay. So the next time I went to the, to the store, I started reading the labels. Now, we all know the popular brands that claim to get rid of your headaches, but like right to the left or to the right, you'll see the brand, and literally picked up and read the ingredients. And they were identical. And, and so the name brand was being charged, you know, the upcharge for that name, and the store brand was going to do the exact same thing. That tip probably just saves somebody some money. The generic drug store, and I'm not saying in all cases, but I would highly recommend that you just consider reading the labels because, we, again, we get stuck into these habits of just, well, this is what I've always purchased. Uh, we want to maybe take a second look at that and start assessing, can I get the same but, but spend less money? We all know this too, so this holds true. Spending habits are easy to get into, but they are not always beneficial. And your financial situation can change, and that $3 cup of coffee may no longer be within your means, or perhaps it never was in place. By periodically examining your finances, you can buy habits you can't afford to keep. Make effort to keep of your daily spending, and when the end of the month comes, total it all up. If you see that you're spending more than you're earning, not able to put away anything in savings, or you're relying on credit to pay for expenses, we need to do a serious evaluation on what you can cut and or reduce. And again, be honest with yourself. That's the whole point of this. Is if, you, if you're honest with yourself, then you can truly see what's a need and what could be eliminated. And remember, wants mimic needs. Here's the example. We need to eat, but we don't need to eat at restaurants regularly. And you want to examine all of your purchases for whether each is a real need 
or a perceived need that can be adjusted. I find that to be very, very uh, prevalent with people who have, we'll say, spending habits or that, that aren't official. They can't decipher the wants and needs. And so, again, that's the, the piece you want to really challenge yourself on to, to make sure you know what you really need and what is just a want. <laughs> All right, so question for the group. We're on impulse buying. I saw impulse buying pop up in the question box a, a little bit earlier. Quite a few people mentioned this as one of those habits they wanted to change. So show of hands, we're going to use the hand button on this one. Show of hands, how many of you have made an impulse purchase in the last 24 hours? Last 24 hours, how many of you have made an impulse purchase? Just want to see a show of hands. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Nice. All right. Good. So I, I hit the hand button too. Um, yeah, I just did one. <laughs> so, yeah, it happens. All right. So put the hands out. All right. So the second question is, how many of you have made an impulse purchase within the last month? So within the last month, you can hit the hand button again for me. How many of you have made an impulse purchase within the last month? Yeah, we got a lot more on that one. Yeah. And I'll be honest, y'all, this has been a challenge. We're all, we're, we're, we're sheltering in place. It's hard not to see all this advertising and these brands and these deals. I mean, it, it's a lot to take in. And, but again, we're human. Things happen. We know that impulse buying isn't good for our wallets. But it's hard to resist sometimes. Finding something that you like unexpectedly and buying it it's exciting, and I'm going to admit, the purchase I just made, it was very exciting. I'm, I don't feel bad, but it was an impulse. And stores, they all doing their best to encourage us to make these impulse purchases. When you go to the supermarket, we all know this. When you're at the checkout line, you have a variety of items that you can select from. You have the magazines, the candy, maybe some soda, maybe it's the gum. And it's right there waiting for you at the checkout line because you forgot to get it. Now, things like eggs and milk, they keep that in the back. They know you're coming to get that, but they're going to make you walk all the way through the store to get to the goods that you want because the marketing people for grocery stores, it's all a game about psychology. They know you need the milk or the bread or the eggs, the important stuff. They're going to put it in certain – it's all about placement because what that requires you to do is – walk through the whole store. So now they're test it, the grocery store is nothing but a test and many people fail all the time. It's just a test. Can you not buy this item? Now research shows that the longer a person stays in the store, like we just talked about, the more likely he or she is to make an impulse purchase. There are many things you can do to be a quick focused shopper. Create a shopping list before you go to the store every time. Like, I don't care if you need three items, make a list for those three items. And once you're there, avoid browsing. Don't take the free samples. Don't try on clothes just to see how they look. And don't talk to salespeople unless you, like, have to. And consider, if you can, shop alone. Like, go by yourself. The time you spend waiting for a friend to shop is time that you have to be tempted by impulse purchases. And this is a tough one, but shopping with your children can lead to impulse purchases for them to keep them occupied while you shop. So if you if your kid's not attached to you or in the cart, they're going to run around and see stuff. So the same thing happens. Now, that not only costs you, but it models impulse spending for them, which can impact how they shop when they grow up. I don't think a lot of people think about that. So my mom had this rule that you know, she had the list, like to this day, I make a grocery list every time because my mom me holds, and she would say, read off to me what's on the list. I had to hold the cart, you know, I got older and I could get out of the cart to walk. She said, hold the cart and you read off my list. And, and that was like we whole route that we made in the store. It was literally what's on the list, Jasper. Okay, great. What's on the list next? Okay, what do we need now? And, and so I was, it was almost like she was testing me to see if I was going to look up and start getting mesmerized with all the colors and the stuff that's in a grocery store. And when you're a little kid, I mean, honestly, adults probably still have 
the section. Like, it's just exciting. All the colors, the displays, like, it's a whole vibe. And she taught me having a grocery list. And to this day, I make a grocery list all the time. It even got to the point where there was an, an elderly lady one day in the grocery store. And this was probably years ago when I was, like, first moved out on my own. And the lady, and I still have back the paper in the back. And the lady walked up and said, what are you doing? She said, I've never seen a person of your age to ever carry a grocery list. And I literally told her the same story I just shared with you, is that a lot of these impulse purchases and this, this, these habits that we build, you know, if you have the children there, they're watching, they're paying attention. And we just want to think about all the things that we do from an impulse buying standpoint. How does that like how does that transition down a generation or two? So just wanted to share that story because that's, you know, something we got to think about. And so shout out to my mom for making it happen. It was, yeah, she trained me very well to not act a fool when you go into grow up. Plus, you spend such less time in a grocery you have to list. Okay, I'm off my grocery list soapbox. You all know where I'm coming from. Just making that list and being mindful of impulses is a uh, thing we, we can't ever forget. All right, so now we're on bargain hunting. And I did see quite a bit of folks who mentioned like they do couponing and things like that. So it sounds like we already have a nice group of bargain hunters. Show of hands, and, and I wanna phrase this. So I wanna see a show of hands for the bargain people who like the coupons, who like saving money. Do you tell your friends how much you save? Like, if you're a real bargain hunter, like, do you tell people, like, hey, I found a really good deal? Just a quick show of hands if you're that, that person. And I'm also going to assume, okay, there's some great hands here. Good, good, good. I'm also going to assume that if you tell them about the good deal, they know you're the friend. Like, you are it. Like, we all have them. I'm not tops on the list of saving, but I'm pretty close. I'll have that friend. You're not said person who's the bargain hunter. You have one of those in your circle. Like I know everybody has it. And when they find a good deal, they share it with the whole group. It's a text thread, email, it's a phone. Hey, know that such and such has a deal on X, Y, and Z. It's just, you become known as the deal person. So bargain hunting is good. Now, as we're looking for sales, it's, it's a great thing that we should do, but we want to make sure it's on things we were actually looking to buy and not these impulse sales that we see. And I believe somebody alluded to this earlier around, uh, I think I saw it in the, in the quick box around, if you weren't planning on buying it, although it's on sale, you still, still should buy it. You tend to think, well, I got the sale, so it was okay that I made this impulse purchase. And, and it happens. I get it. But you didn't go in the store looking for said item, but because it was on sale, you bought it. Mm, maybe we could have used those funds for something else. The thing we want to remember is when you are tempted to buy discounted items, ask yourself if you really need them. And remember to focus on the cost, not just the savings. If you weren't going to buy it anyway, the best bargain is not to buy. All right, next, and I always laugh when I on this slide, I didn't realize this was a real thing. But show of hands, how many of you have ever subscribed to retail therapy? Just a quick show of hands. How many of you have fallen victim to, to maybe you still do it, you had an experience back in the day? Like tell therapy, like how, how many of you have ever, yeah, good, 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 got a quiet hands, okay? Yeah, I I used to laugh. I, until I actually started reading a bit, I never realized it was such a real thing. Like it was, I, I, I would just laugh. I say people shop when they're sad. <laughs> I was like, that's a thing. <laughs> so, I mean, I know people when they're like, it was like I go through a breakup, I go shopping. I thought people eat ice cream, but whatever. So, <laughs> the 
research shows that shopping increases the level of chemicals in the brain that regulate happiness. However, the happiness that buying provides is usually short-lived, and the problems that result from overspending only cause guilt and stress. I'm sure you all knew that already. It seemed good because we were excited, but it didn't, didn't really help. We want to do our best to resist the urge to shop when you're feeling depressed or you're sad or you're lonely, whatever the feelings are. Instead, we want to engage in mood-boosting activities that are free, such as exercising. Maybe you take a walk. Maybe you just open up the window and stick your head out and breathe some fresh air. Just something simple and free. And if you feel that you cannot control your shopping and it is having a negative impact on your life, you might need professional help. I, I hope it doesn't come to you needing the professional, but we got to address this need. And what's interesting is that you may go through bouts of retail therapy. At some point, it gets too much of an issue. It becomes too much of an issue, so the person like literally has to stop because they can't afford to keep doing it. I don't know of any cases where somebody's actually had to go get professional help, but again, if this is a serious issue around depression and loneliness, there, there may be some deeper things we need to explore with the professional. But your outlet being the retail piece, it's, it's, it's very, uh, it could be, I'll say, detrimental to your overall like, budget and your financial plans. All right, so next. I like this slide a lot, and I'm trying to think how I want to do this one. Okay, so I'm going to ask the group a couple of questions on this one. And we're going to use the hand icon again just because we have some great interaction. I know Joy is, is taking great care of the question box. But let's do a show of hands because this is kind of a – got three parts. So the first question, we're talking about money and love. So the first question, show of hands, how many of you have bought a gift for someone to make amends for something you felt guilty about. So you were trying to buy your innocence. How many of you have ever bought a gift for someone you love because you did something? Show of hands, where, where are my people at? We're gonna buy them this gift because that's gonna make them happy. I know I messed up, but we're gonna make amends. I was innocent, I couldn't prove it, but I'm gonna buy you this gift to make sure that you know that I love you. All right, all right, all right, okay. Question number two. How many of you have ever worried that a loved one would get upset if you didn't buy an expensive gift for them? So again, the question is around, have you ever purchased something for a loved one because you didn't want them to get upset, but it was an expensive item, and to keep them happy, you knew they were, you know, just getting that nice gift. So who's done that? Show of hands. All right. I love it. I love the honesty. So I appreciate the honesty. I love. I love this session because we get people get real during this session. I'm gonna bring up a topic. I think I just saw it pop into the box. The five love languages. We're not talking about that, day, but that's exactly where this comes from. Some people just like stuff. They like getting it or they like giving it. And, and so buying gifts is part of people's love language. And that's a great, Lucy, thank you, because I literally was going to mention that. It's one of those things that some people need stuff. They need it. It's how they, it's how they operate. They've always had it and they always want it. All right, so the last question. And a show of hands again on this one. How many of you were asked for money by a friend or a family member and you couldn't say no? So a show of hands, family member, good friend, and you just couldn't say no. Yeah, good, good, a lot of good hands on this one. This is probably the most challenging for most people is we love our families for better or for worse. We love them. And some of us just can't say no. 
I call these the big heart people because you have such a big heart that you just keep giving. And it doesn't get better most in most cases the person who's asking just never seems to figure it out and they just keep coming to you because you have the big heart and they know it and maybe that's how you think you're showing love to them is by giving them what they want and that's okay like if you have it and you can do it and it's not putting you in a situation do what you do but we got to think about this love piece and how spending plays a such a big role Periodically, buying gifts or spending money on loved ones is perfectly normal. People do that. However, we got to avoid draining our wallet trying to buy our love. Not only does it does trying to buy love not work from a relationship point of view, but you shouldn't have to sacrifice your financial health for others. If you are feeling guilty about something you did, address it head on instead of shelling out money to fix the problem. Try that first. Try having the conversation first, and then maybe consider them getting a, little, a nice little token. And if you need to buy a gift, mind that most people prefer thoughtful gifts to an expensive one. Now, I know we're generalizing on that. I've met people who are like, no, it needs to be expensive. I have expensive taste. But people still like the thought. And there are many things you can do that are nice that don't cost you anything. I mean, we all know how to do gifts, but for some reason we feel like the more I spend, the more they're gonna appreciate it, the more love they feel like I'm giving them. So I, I, I think I'm lucky and I think my dad is very lucky. And, and I don't know how to say this. My mom doesn't spend a lot of money. And to this day, and it, my parents have been married 45 years. It's a it's a running joke that my mom just doesn't go out and spend money. Like she doesn't need a new dress. She doesn't wear a lot of jewelry. Like my dad jokes about how much money he's gonna have just as they get older because my mom never spends. He spends way more than she does. And even around like Christmas time, like I I live in California. My family's back in North Carolina, and my mom would tell me. She said this to me she, years years ago. She would say. Don't pay for that expensive flight to come home for a few days. Just call us and wish us, you know, happy birthday, Merry Christmas, or whatever else. You know, she was like, don't keep wasting money flying home just to see me. And I was like, well, mom, don't you want to see your, your baby? Like, I'm the, I'm the youngest. And so I would always hit it with the, don't you want to see your baby boy? <laughs> so it got to the point where I just send my mom a card. And even then she would say, you know you don't have to send me anything. I mean, I swear to you all, I'm confessing right now. I literally just call my mom on birthdays. On her birthday, I just call her. Hey, mom, happy birthday. Okay, great. And then she hangs up. I mean, it's the easiest. Oh, man, I don't spend a lot of money on my mom. I don't have to spend it on my dad. Like, my sister, different story. Like, I got to send money on her. She likes, she's the gift person. Like, I give her stuff because she loves it. Um, that's, I'm willing to do that. I know her. I love her. But she likes stuff. Um, and, and so we, we got to think about, all of these these gifts that we're giving and are we putting ourselves in a situation if we're not you keep it going but if you're seeing you're putting yourself in a real pinch every month because you're you're shelling out so much money for everybody else then you know we need to make some adjustments and if you are a giver who was always you know you need to outstretch your hand and family recognize that giving them money may do more harm than good and I've heard this a lot where some people just, you know, you give that person the money and it's gone and they're back like sweet. And you're like, what happened? And they have some other excuse and you just feel so inclined to continue to give. And, you know, it just it doesn't help in the long run. So I know it's tough to, to deal with family members and loved ones. But if you love them, like you say, you just worth trying to have that out to a courageous conversation about how. I can't keep funding whatever it is you're funding for them. You know, I'm all for helping people out, but at some point, you know, I have to kind of put plans first and not put up in the situation. It's hard. And I'll say that again. It's hard. We all know. But I'm just going to challenge you to, to try a little bit harder to, to not keep that going. All right. So. We'll talk about spending versus saving. Now, people tend to focus more on today than tomorrow. We all know that to be true. And in many cases, that is sensible. You know, filling in a refrigerator is a more of a need than saving for a vacation five years from now. 
However, we often put immediate desires ahead of future important needs. So let's say you have $100 in your pocket. You can either spend it on a fancy meal or put it into savings. If you spend it on a meal, you get to that today. If you put it in savings, you got to wait, which is, which is naturally more appealing. The meal, we get that now, is delicious. And it can be especially hard to save for things that are far off, like retirement. We tell ourselves we can always start doing it again tomorrow, but tomorrow comes and you tell yourself the same thing again, I'll do it, I'll get to it. And as old, many people don't save enough to meet their goals. Speaking about this retirement piece, and this is, this is true stuff, there, was, there have been studies from a lot of companies around the psychology and the emotionals and the, the, the things that we know to be true about why there's this disconnect about people and saving for retirement. And a lot of people don't save enough. They don't invest enough for retirement. And so there were these that were done. And what they found that there's a, 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 there's a, a connection that's not being made in your brain. So you're telling yourself to pay a complete stranger. But that stranger is the older you. But there's a disconnect. So you can't mentally understand why am I paying this person who, ha who I have never met. And this person is you. It's the older you. So your future self is relying on your current self to do right. But there's a disconnect. Then we feel as if we're paying money to a stranger. Hey, I was blown away by this. It's, it's interesting stuff when you read about ecology. There's math involved and there's all this crazy you know, investment jumbo, but we're talking basic fundamentals, like how we think and process this information. It's, 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 it's very interesting. I, I say if you've never looked into some of these behaviors or the psychology behind spending or investing or saving, I mean, it's a lot, but it is very, very interesting stuff. What we got to do is make a concerted effort to place savings in the forefront now. Put pictures of goals on your refrigerator, in your wallet, on your mirror. Just leave yourself reminders to do this. And the easiest thing, as we probably all know, is set things up on autopilot, whether it's a direct deposit from your job or from like a check to a savings. You just want to automate the process so then you're not thinking about it. And time is your friend. And so if you're waiting, I'm going to ask you to is like waiting because the sooner you start saving, the more money you'll have to show for it later. So we'll touch on credit here briefly, and we know that the availability of credit can make it easy, like super easy to overspend. And the research shows that people spend more when they use credit instead of cash or debit cards. Think about this, and I don't know the last time you spent some cash, but there is an emotional thing that happens when you pull that money out of your pocket, your wallet, or wherever you have it. When you, you, you're touching them, you're like, ooh, look at the dream, it's in my hands, and then you away. And you have this, it's almost like a letdown. You're like, oh, I just gave away some money. And so there's a lot of techniques that will say, help them to get past some of their spending habits or issues is that they use cash. Because now it's tough for you to part ways with it. Because there's that physical action. See, credit cards, debit cards, it, it changes the whole dynamic of spend. Because now we just swipe a card. You know, credit cards, so that that's connected checking account. So you still need to have the money. And, and people still kind of overspend and don't have the money. But the credit card is where most people get in trouble because there's no immediate payback. I just do this today and I can pay for it later. But if we don't remember to pay off that bill in full, then those interest charges get hit. And, and so that's where we get into a lot of trouble because we don't have that connection like, oh, I lost the money. No, I spent some money, and I kind of got to wait like a month before I even have to pay on it. But, but again, that plays with our, with our brains. Now, using cash or a debit card for most purchases can help you be a thrifty shopper, but you don't necessarily want to avoid credit completely. So. Use your credit cards in a responsible way and build good credit. Because, of course, we all know that having good credit helps you with mortgages, with car loans. You know, I know sometimes when you're applying for insurances, they're looking at your credit report. You know, an employer, I mean, we want to have good credit, okay? 
And a good way to use your credit cards is to just a small purchase or a couple of small purchases and just pay off the And somebody joked about this, but I'll bring this example. You don't have to charge it a lot, like $5 or the store man, you know, you know there's cost with their stretching or using credit cards, but the bank of smart is often full. And if you can just rinse and repeat that, you will never have credit issues ever. Spend it all. All right. So, and, and kind of wrapping all of this up, we, we've covered a lot, had some really good discussion or action in, in the question box, and I appreciate all of your engagement. Here's the last thing. Earning money takes a lot of time and effort, which we know. And we need to spend our money with the same care by being a conscious consumer. And here's some questions you want to ask yourself before you make any purchase. And you may not go through all six of these. And I'm not going to read them to you here. They're here on the slide here. But we just want to think about all of these things or maybe a few of these things before you make the purchase. Now, for, for those of you, again, uh, just a reminder, you get the recording at the end. So if you don't you know, jot all these down right now, just know you'll have access to the recording so you can come back and just you know, kind of jot down these questions. But you just want to ask yourself, and, and being more conscious as a consumer, that's the whole play. I don't care if you spend your money on luxury goods and items, but just be mindful of what you're doing. And by thinking about your spending, you can get what you need and enjoy it without suffering from the post-shopping blues. And that, my friends, brings us to the end. I have it. I've had a really good time with this one. Joy, big shout out to you. You have been like just handling the question box. I've been seeing so much activity, and yeah, I can just see the level of engagement was amazing. And I appreciate all of you who decided to attend the session because I, I think it never hurts to kind of revisit some of these things. Now, just be mindful that when we finish up, we have a few minutes left, um, there's going to be a feedback survey that you'll get, and there's also the link to the seven-day recording. So, again, you got seven days, like starting today. So... <laughs> You know, you finish up today, the clock starts tomorrow, you got seven days, that recording is going to be available. And if there's anything that you miss throughout the session, feel free to check out the recording, pause it as much as you need, review it. You know, I think I challenged all of you earlier is share this with somebody. You know, we talked about the self-evaluation. Share that with your significant other or your spouse. Share these, you know, uh, those consumer questions we just talked about. That that's where it gets good. Like you're going to do okay because you attended the webinar today, but it's everybody else who didn't attend or it's going to be everybody else who doesn't view the recording. Like that's, we want to keep spreading this type of messaging because the way we think about money, just it does so much for the actions we take or don't take. So I'll end with that. Uh, Joe, I know we got a, uh, the question box has been on fire today, and I, I just want to thank you again for just – taking good care of, of, of this for me as we've kind of gone through the session. And I know we got a few minutes left and we can answer a few of these live if, if you'd like to. And I'm gonna take a look over here too to see kind of what, what we got left. We got a few minutes left. So if there's any other questions we can, you know, we have <laughs> a minute left. So if we have one good question we wanna discuss, we can do that before we wrap up. Or if, Joy, if you wanna just knock these out while we're here, we'll, we'll either way is fine with me. Um, why don't, if you can go ahead and put the slide back on the be a conscious consumer again, and then we can answer yeah. Nancy's question. Um, she is thinking of someone or what is the thinking of someone who is a hoarder? Why do you think that they have problems with their psychology of spending? Yeah, the hoarders, you know, honestly, they, they're the ones who might need the professional help. And I'm not even trying to make a joke of this. Like, that's why that whole show became a thing, that there are people, like, psychologically don't understand that this is a problem. You know, if, if, you've, if anybody has seen those hoarder shows, it's, it's a nightmare. Like, the stuff that you see and how they live, and they act as if that is normal. And we all know that it's not. 
it is not normal. So I think for hoarders, and there are varying levels of, uh, I guess you can call it hoardery. I don't know if that's a word. I just made it up. Hoarder. Like if you're a hoarder, there, there are some underlying issues there, and we might need that professional to really help us kind of chime in and, and, and kind of interrupt our way of thinking because I think there's a lot more that needs to be kind of discussed if, if you are a serious hoarder. Um, but with that, folks, we have come up on time. Thank you. Thank you for supporting Balance, you know, all of our supporting partners who to tune into these these free webinar sessions. Uh, big shout out to Joy. Joy, I saw you holding it down in the question box, you know, shouts out to you because you have been like a superstar. Like I, I was just watching you take the questions out left and right. So thank you for for taking care of the question box for us today. And thank you all for attending. I love and appreciate, I'm sure Joy feels the same. We love the engagement. It makes this time go by so much quicker. And so with that, we're gonna wish you all a wonderful rest of your day. You know, stay tuned for, for more stuff from Bounds that we're always doing these type of efforts. And let's just make sure we keep spreading this information. And so with that, I wanna bid you all fail. And again, stay, stay healthy and enjoy the rest of your day.